Today is June 4th. It is the anniversary of the Tiananmen Square Massacre, which I intend to talk about in more detail today. It is something that the People's Republic of China is trying to make into unhistory by mm, punishing anyone within their reach who wants to talk about it. Well, I'm not within your reach. And if you want to come try to find me, I'm a life member of the National Rifle Association. Figure it out. As to uh, what we're doing today, we're talking about the late Cold War. And we start out with what nuclear weapons become like uh, in the late, in the mid Cold War, and what overshadows the late Cold War. There is a nuclear triad that develops first in the United States and later in the Soviet Union. The triad is, and you should have notes out, obviously, land-based bombers. The United States invests a lot in them, even though surface-to-air missiles make surviving a bombing run over the Soviet Union less and less likely. Land-based ICBMs. ICBM is an acronym for Intercontinental Ballistic Missile. And then Submarine Launched Ballistic, ballistic Missiles. Now, it is possible that a defense may shoot down your bombers before they hit their targets. It is even possible that a sneak attack first strike will take out your land-based missiles unless they're in hardened silos. However, even to this day, no one really knows how to track a nuclear submarine underwater at distance. You can't just pop up a world map on a computer screen somewhere and locate all of the ballistic missile submarines or the hunter-killer submarines. They don't appear because they're underwater and so far so far the best sensing system underwater is short range sonar passive where you have headphones or uh, microphones where you listen to the sea and active where you're pinging out to try to get echoes like in world war ii <clears throat> the nuclear triad starts out with a single nuclear weapon atop each missile but by the 1980s, we end up with what are called MIRVs. God, the Cold War loves its acronyms. MIRVs are multiply independent uh, reentry vehicles. Multiple re uh, independent reentry vehicles. So, if you've got a Russian Satan missile, yeah, their most recent land-based missile is called Satan. Um, it launches, and you've got a single missile. Now, we do have some defensive measures against missiles. However, before, after the Satan leaves the atmosphere and before it re-enters the atmosphere, the nose cone opens up and a series of black cones disperse and go on ballistic trajectories. A single missile can hit three targets, then eight targets, then 16 targets, some 24 targets, and you've got thousands of missiles. So you do the math. The nuclear threat becomes overwhelming into the 1970s. It's no longer a question, can a country defend itself? Because the truth is, even if a single nuclear weapon is detonated, your country will never be the same. If a handful are detonated, your country may enter a new dark age. If every nuclear weapon that's launched in the 1980s that exists, where there are about 50,000 of them, nothing lives. Not viruses, not roaches, nothing. Since the end of the Cold War, we've reduced nuclear uh, stockpiles, but it is still 
a threat. In fact, and we've talked about this, given who now has nuclear weapons, possibly the Iranians, definitely the Pakistanis and the Indians, uh, definitely the North Koreans, definitely the Chinese, as well as the Russians, just in our list of enemies, plus the Brits, the French, the Israelis, the Japanese, at one time the South Africans, at one time the Libyans. The more people who have them, who didn't earn them, the more likely it is that there will be a temptation to, quote, settle this, whatever this is, once and for all. The most likely tripwire points to start a nuclear war exist in the Middle East with the Islamist insistence on treating Israel like a crusader state and on flaunting with Hitler-like ideas of genocide with nuclear weapons. The Iranians have talked about this publicly. They are the primary source of terror on the planet. One of the reasons why several Arab countries in the last months of the Trump administration made peace with Israel is because the Iranians scare them more than they hate the Jews. That's a lot. So, the Middle East, particularly Iran and Israel. The Korean Peninsula. We are not at peace with North Korea. We are still officially at war with North Korea, we being the United Nations, which we're a part of. And given the nature of the bat nuts crazy leadership of Kim Il sung, Kim Jong il, and Kim Jong un, and now Kim Jong un's sister, anything is possible with them. Anything. They are completely unpredictable. And they have not only nuclear weapons, they have the missiles to carry them. And they have been testing. Uh, an approach to nuclear warfare that involves high atmospheric bursts, electromagnetic pulses, and destroying the power grid of the United States, which would be a devastating thing. India and Pakistan. This Indian subcontinent, which the British used to call it, is a flashpoint because of the ongoing crowding and poverty of both nations, plus, ba plus Bangladesh and Nepal and the other little states around it, Ceylon. The history of terrorism in these countries, the Tamil Tigers come to mind. They are a uh, terrorist group for a people near the southern tip of India and the northern tip of Sri Lanka. And the fact that because they're so crowded, so impoverished, and so short-tempered, sometimes accidents happen, people die, and then you have riots. Sometimes accidents happen, people die, and you have wars. There have been several wars between India and Pakistan. Most Americans don't know about this. Some Americans do. And the fact that both of them have atomic weapons and missiles to carry them means that in a fit of anger, rage, or despair, any one of these places might launch. There are other tripwires. The North Atlantic Treaty Organization now extends to Eastern Europe. After the Cold War, it came to include Poland and the Baltic <clears throat> States. Vladimir Putin and his Russian nationalists want to reclaim a lot of the old Soviet Union's glory, and that means territory. If the Soviets invade a NATO country, we're at war day one. And if they push things beyond a certain point, we are expected to use our atomic weapons to offset any advantage the Soviets have in conventional weapons on the ground. They also have very good weapons. The Russian economy may be a basket case, but Putin's Russia has produced at least a number of showpiece weapons projects that are more advanced than many of ours, which is not a good thing. There are also tripwires all around China. China has quietly claimed the Russian Siberia region and the Russian Far East, but they don't push it because they and the Russians are allies against us. 
but they talked about it. In the South China Sea, the Chinese claim everything, even though Vietnam, the Philippines, Malaya, I'm sorry, Malaysia, and Indonesia, not to mention Taiwan, all have valid claims to parts of the South China Sea. And international law says that freedom of navigation means that anyone should be able to transit the South China Sea. But the Chinese communists for decades have insisted on any map made in China, including what's called the Nine Dash Line, which basically claims the entire South China Sea except for the immediate coastal waters of the other countries. Taiwan. The Chinese communists have a desperate desire to return, quote, return, unquote, Taiwan to Chinese control. Now, the last Chinese government to rule in Taiwan was the Qing Empire. Over, well, let's see, 1894 to now, that's what, 125, 130 years ago? Since then, Taiwan has been a Japanese colony, and after that, it has been a free country. In fact, a country that proves the lie of the Chinese Communist Party, which says that China is not compatible with Western democracy, that China needs an imperial-style government, and the communists give them that. Taiwan does very well with freedom, and it embarrasses the hell out of them. So the communist government of China once claimed that they would reclaim Taiwan by force before the year 2020. They haven't done that. COVID may have interfered. But the new claim is before 2025 or before 2030, depending upon who you ask. There are those who believe that the Chinese communists will move on Taiwan sooner or later because they calculate that the West has a memory of atrocity that lasts less than 20 years. After all, the Tiananmen Square massacre happened in 1989, and by 1999, there was normalized relations, and by 2009, the West had heavily invested in China. The 100th anniversary of the Chinese vic Communist Party's victory is October of 2049. If they're going to use this theory of the West only having a 20-year memory, bless you, for atrocity, and if the invasion of Taiwan proves to be messy, which it will, if they do it before 2029, they calculate that the rest of the world won't really care about it by 2049. Then there's Japan. If you turn on Chinese television, most any night, you'll see movies excoriating the evil Japanese. And there are reasons for the Chinese to have a hatred of the Japanese that go back to the Japanese wars in China in the 19-teens, 20s, and 30s, uh, and 40s. Uh, war crimes were committed. The Japanese, as I've tried to explain to you, of those eras <clears throat> were vicious. However, the Japan of today is not the Japan of that time. But the Chinese can unify their people anytime they want by provoking a crisis with the Japanese. China has nuclear weapons. Japan can have nuclear weapons anytime it wants. It probably does. <clears throat> so we are pledged to protect Japan with alliance, South Korea with alliance, Taiwan with promises short of an alliance. The Philippines used to be an American colony. We have a defensive alliance with them. The Vietnamese and us have been cozying up because we both distrust the Chinese. Uh, the Malaysians and the Indonesians to a degree also. Australia and New Zealand, who have been threatened with nuclear attacks by Chinese state-run media, are also getting more involved. And India, because China has allied with Pakistan, is more closely aligning with us. At any of these flashpoints, war could start with a plausible path towards nuclearization. That's simply the way things are. I thought you should know.
In the 1970s, as the Vietnam War is coming to a close, the West is weakened. The linchpin of the West is the United States. And the United States, <clears throat> 25 years after the end of World War II, is fatigued. The Americans are war-weary. Many Americans want out of Vietnam, regardless of what happens there after we leave. Uh, the American economy begins a period of what is known as stagnation and inflation. Inflation, well, you'll learn about it over the next few months, is when your dollar buys less and less and less. It has less buying power because there is just more of them. And stagnation is when the economy is not growing. In the past, before the 1970s, you either have an inflationary cycle where the economy is overheating, or you have stagnation, which is sort of like a mini depression. But in the early 70s, the economy finds a way to smack us with both simultaneously. The American economy is failing, uh, to an extent. In the Third World, the Soviets are aligned with any revolutionary group that wants to fight either colonial governments or former colonial governments. And these um, revolutionaries, some of which are utterly brutal, have nothing uh, to do with genuine communism, are armed and equipped by both the Soviets and the Chinese in order to confusticate the West and uh, expand their power. Today, the Chinese have basically tried to recolonize Sub-Saharan Africa. I'll say that again. Today, basically, the Chinese have attempted to recolonize Sub-Saharan Africa. You're gonna learn next week how the West leaves Africa in the 1960s and 70s. Through their Belt and Road Initiative, many Sub-Saharan African countries have been trapped into uh, subservience to the People's Republic of China through debt. <clears throat> but in the 1970s, lots of struggles against the West are being funded by Moscow, and we can't put out all the fires, certainly not in a war-weary United States. Something I'm not going to mention much here because I'll talk about it next week, is after 1973, the Yom Kippur War, a war between the Arabs and Israelis where we airlift emergency supplies to keep Israel afloat, we become the target of ire for Islamists everywhere, and they stop selling oil to us. The Arab oil embargoes of 1974-75 and later in 1979 destroy certain aspects of the American economy. One aspect, the single in, uh, income family. Before the oil embargoes, a working class American man could provide a house, college education, vehicles, and a good living standard to his family. But with the inflation caused by fuel prices going from well under a dollar a gallon to well over a dollar a gallon, just like that, because the supply throttle is throttled by the Arabs, you suddenly need more than one income to maintain that standard of living. It is not simply because the world wakes up to the idea of women in the workplace in the 1970s. There's an economic thing that prompts it too. With the Arab oil embargo, if a family wants to maintain that middle-class living standard, Maybe the wife needs to take a part-time job. Maybe she needs to take a full-time job. It's not simply about some notion of utopian liberation. It's a way for Americans to maintain the living standards to which they've become accustomed. A single paperback book before the embargo cost 50, 75 cents, under a dollar. In 1979, that same paperback book costs $4.99. The product is not significantly different, but the economy is. The buying power of the dollar has shrunk so much that what less than a dollar would have bought six, seven years before, you now need $5 to buy. That Reduction in buying power is what I'm talking about when I say that you need more than one income to maintain your living standard. And the American economy has not recovered from this. Today, two income households are the norm.
However, despite our defeat or our impending defeat in Viet Vietnam, the Nixon administration, sensing our weakness, decides to play a diplomat diplomatic game called detente. If you know French, detente means a release of tensions. It's actually an archery term. When you've been holding your arrow back and you, are, you don't want to shoot, you want to release the tension on your bow and unknot your arrow, that release of tension is called detente. Talk to Dr. LeBlanc about it. She may have more insights on it than I do. Detente is a release of tensions in the Cold War. So, President Nixon, at the height of the butchery of Mao Zedong's cultural revolution, goes to China. He's the first American president to do that. He's still a hero to many Chinese because he was willing to come to China, recognize China as important, and uh, feelings about him there are very strong, even to this day. And he negotiates with Mao. And then, a few months later, he goes to Moscow and negotiates with Leonid Brezhnev, the leader of the Soviet Union. These negotiations do a few things. Number one, they reduce the help which China and Russia are willing to give the North Vietnamese, slowing down the time when they're going to betray us. Number two, by accepting that the communists will advance in Africa and parts of Asia, Nixon is able to ease tensions in Europe and in East Asia. Communists will advance in Sub-Saharan Africa. They'll try their games in Latin America, but we'll squash them. Uh, they'll try their games in Southeast Asia. and But in Northeast Asia with Japan, tensions reduce. In Europe, tensions reduce. Detente works at making the world less ready to go to war. And the communists do advance. The Vietnamese, North, communist North Vietnamese win Vietnam. The Khmer Rouge win in Cambodia and begin their slaughter of over one-third of their population, known as the Killing Fields. But we hold on. In the late 1970s, things begin to change. Islamism is on the rise. As I'll tell you next week, the Shah of Iran, our ally, is overthrown in 1978 by Islamist revolutionaries, led by the Ayatollah Khomeini, who'd been living in Paris. Khomeini calls the United States the great Satan. Israel is the little Satan. And the Iranians begin to fund groups designed to mess with us everywhere they can and mess with the Israelis everywhere they can, including taking hostages. The Iranians seized the U.S. Embassy in Tehran in the autumn of 1979. They take captive hundreds of American diplomatic workers there. Now, embassy soil is supposed to be sacred, and the host country is supposed to protect the embassy against riots. Riots outside the American embassy, American embassies around the world are nothing new. But when the police and the army sit by as Iranian students, terrorists, break into over the fence, capture the people in the embassy, take them out of the embassy, parading them around, obviously having been beaten and blindfolded, uh, and treating them like animals in front of the international press. This is about humiliating the United States. For the next 444 days, American Nightly News begins with America held hostage day, whatever it happens to be. The American people are not used to this. They're not used to our people being used as pawns. They're not used to our people being beaten on international television and abused. President Carter who is not the most aggressive of presidents, tries diplomacy and diplomacy, and it fails, and it fails. I'll tell you more about it next week, but what it does is it ignites Islamism as a force in the world around 1980. And in Afghanistan, there's a change of government that disturbs the Soviets. So, in November or December, around the 
around my birthday. Uh, late November, early December 1979, Soviet tank armies crossed the Afghani border. And suddenly Afghanistan is a war zone between the Soviets and the Afghan people. This war lasts 10 years. We are going to pay the Soviets back for what they did to us in Vietnam. They gave the North Vietnamese anti-aircraft missiles. We gave the Afghan Mujahideen, the Holy Warriors of God, Stinger missiles. They gave the Vietnamese money and guns. We gave the Mujahideen money and guns. They taught the uh, North Vietnamese how to fight American forces. We taught the Mujahideen how to fight Soviet forces. One of the Arabs who went to Afghanistan was Osama bin Laden. The core group of Al-Qaeda were among the foreign fighters fighting with the Afghanis against the Soviets in the 1980s, who we helped train and support. Why? Because the enemy of our enemy is our ally. The Soviets were a much bigger threat than the Muslims, than the, uh, than the Islamists at that time. We're going to bleed them in Afghanistan the way they bled us in Vietnam, and we do. And ultimately, one of the problems the Soviets faced in the late 1980s is that like us in the early 1970s, they become a war-weary society that's profoundly divided against itself. One of the people behind this is President Ronald Wilson Reagan. Ronald Reagan is a former actor, Democrat, leader of the Screen Actors Guild, who uh, in the late 1950s becomes an anti-communist and then a Republican as the Democrat Party moves to the left. He is governor of California for two terms, and he becomes, he runs against moderate Republican Gerald Ford in 1976 and loses the Republican nomination, but achieves the Republican nomination in 1980. In the midst of the Iran hostage crisis with President Carter looking weak, Ronald Reagan wins the election. Reagan, is an old-fashioned conservative who tells the Iranians, if I am president and those hostages are still being held, you savages are going to suffer <laughs> things that you can't even imagine. He calls them savages, he's not diplomatic, and he threatens them with the full force of the American military. The hour that he is sworn into office the hostages are on a plane leaving Iranian airspace. Reagan rebuilds our military, challenging the Soviets. He pushes the Soviets. A lot of moderate Republicans and Democrats say, you don't want to push the Soviets. You could provoke World War III. Reagan publicly calls them the evil empire, which steals human liberty, liberty around the world. One of the first times I ever heard of Joe Biden was in around 1982. We wanted to modernize our nuclear forces based in Europe. So NATO had planned to take American Pershing II medium range missiles into German, British, and Italian territory. Um, so this, the Soviets attacked, they understood that there would be people with nuclear weapons very close to the front, and if you push them, they'll launch. It's a tripwire. It intensifies the defense of Western Europe. Oh my God, did the international left scream and cry and bleat about this. Pre uh, Senator Joe Biden of Delaware said, what we need is a nuclear freeze. We need to just freeze nuclear weapons where they are to avoid provoking the Soviets. The nuclear freeze movement caused massive riots in Europe and in American cities. Reagan persisted. Most of the smart people in the State Department said, you don't want to push the Russians on this. Reagan persisted, and we modernized our forces. The Soviets were forced to modernize theirs. This, this cost, costs money. In, I think, 1983, President Reagan announces the Star Wars program. Now, Star Wars as a movie came out in 1977. 1983, what Reagan is proposing is a space-based and ground-based anti-missile system. A system using satellite weaponry, including particle accelerators, high-powered lasers, 
anti-missile missiles and rockets um, based in orbit, in the air, and on the ground. Something that could basically nullify the nuclear threat posed by the Russians. Again, with prominent voices like Joe Biden's, moderate Republicans and Democrats said, you're going to destabilize things. The Soviets count on their ability to destroy us. The theory of the nuclear triad is MAD, Mutually Assured Destruction, which is an acronym, acronym you need to know. MAD, Mutually Assured Destruction, keeps the world safe, they said, because the Soviets know they can destroy us anytime they need to. We know we can destroy them anytime we need to. Therefore, we don't have to push it. They don't have to push it. But Reagan says this is absolutely obscene and immoral. Peace is not stuck in an embrace where somebody's holding a straight razor to your throat. Peace means something very different. Reagan pushes forward with the Star Wars Missile Defense Program, as it's called. Now, in the Soviet Union, their leadership is plagued. Brezhnev ends up having progressively worse diseases in the late 1970s. But the Soviets don't want to replace him because it might seem weak. Brezhnev seems stable. But by 1980, Brezhnev is basically a puppet in the hands of the people who he supposedly commands. They tell him what to do, they put him places, they tell him to say things, he reads the script. Then he dies. Yuri Andropov takes over. He's the head of the KGB, their spy network. He dies. Konstantin Chernyenko, an old line Stalinist, takes over, but he can barely move. He dies. There's a song in the early 1980s called The ABCs of Dead Russian Leaders. If I have time at the end of class, I will play it for you because it's funny. Uh, Brezhnev, Andropov, Chernyenko all die within basically a year and a half. The new leader of the Soviets are, uh, is uh, Mikhail Sergeyevich Gorbachev. Gorbachev is bald, he has a famous birthmark, and Gorbachev, like Khrushchev, is a moderate communist in the sense that he wants to liberalize and modernize communism. He introduces glasnost which is an openness that allow, will allow people to speak freely about things that are wrong with society. After all, we can't fix what's wrong if we don't know it's there. So the old controls over speech in the Soviet Union and the Eastern Bloc are pulled back because of his policy of glasnost, openness. His other policy is known as perestroika. Perestroika is the restructuring of communism to modernize it, and make it better for its people and more efficient. This is an echo of Khrushchev's old goulash communism. So the Soviet Union begins going through some internal reforms. But at the same time, Reagan has modernized the intermediate we weapons in Europe. Reagan is pushing strategic defense initiative. Gorbachev goes to Iceland in uh, 1986 or 87 to meet with Reagan. At Reykjavik, Iceland, the capital city of Iceland, Gorbachev offers to give away almost every concession he can to the Americans in the Cold War in return for the Strategic Defense Initiative being canceled. The Soviets are terrified of it. Reagan says, thank you, but no thank you. We're going to pursue it. You can pursue your own if you like. The cognoscenti, the media, the academic world, progressives and moderates everywhere, say that Reagan was a damn fool. The Soviets are conceding almost everything in return for getting rid of SDI, Star Wars. But by pushing it, Reagan pushes an economy that's already flying apart in the Soviet Union to completely fail. Now, this is a risk. As the Soviet Union is collapsing economically in the late 1970s, uh, like late 1980s and early 90s, there is a chance that Gorbachev or that somebody else in the Kremlin might decide that the only way they're going to hold power 
is by creating a foreign crisis and launching a foreign war. Why? Because a foreign war will unify the people. It almost always does. People rally around the flag. If they perceive a threat to all, they tend to get behind whoever's the leader, even if they don't normally like him, because it's wartime. So President Reagan is running a risk that the Russians are going to do what Russians usually do, which is when they have domestic problems, they, they launch a war somewhere in order to maintain power. At the same time, in Eastern Europe, just as Khrushchev's liberalization provokes the Hungarian uprising of 1956 and Brezhnev's accession provokes the Prague Spring of 1968, when Gorbachev talks about perestroika in Glasnost, in Eastern Europe, there are a series of anti-totalitarian measures and movements. In Poland, the biggest one is called Solidarnosc, which in English is solidarity. It's a trade union. It's a trade union of shipbuilders, of heavy industry factory workers, the exact kind of people communism is supposed to be there for, come together in Gdansk, Poland, that's Danzig, and they start protesting Soviet policy, saying that they want a free trade union, not under the thumb of the Communist Party. The communists don't know what to do about this. Their whole justification for existence is to help the kind of urban heavy industry factory workers that make up the Solidarity Trade Union. And after a while, of course, they decide to suppress it by force. But by this point, most Poles and many other Eastern Europeans have gotten the message and have begun to organize under the ground, underground against the Soviets. They're also helped by the new Pope. Pope John Paul II is the first non-Italian Pope in 600 years. He is a Polish Pope. He's from Krakow, Poland. He personally lived under dictatorship, the Nazis, and the Communists. As a priest, as a bishop, as a cardinal, Karol Wojtyla, who became Pope John Paul II, stuck it to the Communist Party whenever he could, without pushing it so far that they would come in and shoot him and his priests and nuns and monks. From Rome, Pope John Paul worked with Ronald Reagan and other Western politicians like Britain's Margaret Thatcher to push the Soviet Union by pushing this notion, simple notion, the dignity of man, human dignity. Does human dignity, which includes freedom, the right to be left alone, the right to think and speak as you wish, the right to work hard and support your family, the right to have a life independent of the government's will, does human dignity, is human dignity better, better served by communist utopia or by freedom? And that question is something which causes the Soviets to melt like sugar in the rain. What happens in 1989 is, is called the Velvet Revolution. Throughout Eastern Europe, peaceful protests are held and governments begin to fall. In Czechoslovakia, a former playwright and prisoner of the communists, Václav Havel, becomes president. In Poland, Lech Walesa, the leader of the Solidarity Trade Union, becomes president. In Romania, the bloody-handed dictator Nicolae Ceausescu and his wife are put on trial and executed for their crimes against the Romanian people. Yugoslavia falls apart. That's not so good. In the Soviet Union, Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia all break free. Belarus, White Russia, breaks free. The Ukraine breaks free. Russia is left to its own devices. Even Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, there's one other, I always forget. Turkmenistan, in Central Asia, all break free. The Soviet Empire snaps apart. Briefly, in the autumn of 1991, 
hardline Stalinists try disposing Gorbachev and restoring the old Soviet Union, but it's too late. Within a week, a Russian politician named Boris Yeltsin, a fat drunkard, but a fat drunkard in the good cause, jumps onto a Soviet tank and starts shouting at the soldiers inside to stop threatening your own people. The Soviet Union collapses. Gorbachev comes to San Francisco and becomes a professional speaker. And I believe he's still there with his family. Um, and the Soviet Union finally falls. The first earnest of this is the fall of the Berlin Wall in December of 1989. November, December. The Berlin Wall, as I've told you, is a unique fortification in world history, designed by the people outside to keep the people outside from getting inside. Many, many hundreds of Germans are killed trying to cross the Berlin Wall. In 1989, crowds from west and east come together, and the Stasi, the hated border police of the communist East Germans, does not shoot them. And the people of Berlin do what the people of Paris did in July of 1789. They take apart stone by stone the hated symbol of an oppressive tyranny. As the French of Paris take, took apart the Bastille, the people of Berlin, uh, East and West Berlin, take apart the Berlin Wall stone by stone. I admit I never would have thought I would have seen the day. President Reagan, just two years before, in imitation of President Kennedy, went to the Brandenburg Gate and made a speech saying, Mr. Gorbachev, if you want to truly reform communism, tear down this wall. Well, Gorbachev did what the people of Berlin did, but Gorbachev allowed it. Gorbachev did not send in the tanks. Eastern Europe is free. The former colonies of the Soviet Union are free. Now, as this is all going on in Europe, a similar movement of people exactly my age is going on in China. In early 1989, college students began gathering in the Plaza of Heavenly Peace, that is Tiananmen Square, which is um, a center point in the city of Beijing, China, the capital. At first, they're protesting a government official who tends to be moderate and reformist being cast out. But then they begin asking for liberalization within communism. Then, after a month or more of that, they begin asking for freedom. Out of paper mache, they build a goddess of democracy, a goddess of liberty, in imitation of our Statue of Liberty. American flags are seen in the crowd. The young people of China's elite universities are calling for either the reform of communism so that it is less totalitarian and less oppressive, or even the replacement of communism with a genuine democracy. This is exactly what's going on in Eastern Europe. It's exactly what's going on eventually in Russia. It is going to lead to the fall of communism in Eastern Europe and in Russia. Now, the leader of China at the time was a man that most Americans, including myself, thought was a reformer. His name was Deng Xiaoping. After the fall of Mao Zedong, after his death, actually, and the fall of his cronies, Deng opened up to the West, made an alliance with the United States against the Soviets, because at that time the Soviets seemed to be stronger than we. Deng came to the United States, went to Texas, wore a cowboy hat, went to a rodeo. Seemed like a cute little Chinaman. And he opened China to foreign trade, foreign travel, the movie The Last Emperor, which I've shown you bits of, were filmed in Deng's China in the late 1980s, before, before that, before Tiananmen Square. But now Deng calculates that he'll fall. Communism will fall. These are the people that murdered 80 to 100 million people in peacetime. If communism falls, the people who survive its fall, who are communists, have a hell of a lot to answer for. They don't want that to happen. They don't want to lose power. They would see the world burn if they could be the rulers of the ashes. 
So there's an attempt to send the army in in May to crush the protesters. But a senior general in the People's Liberation Army says no. Whole units in the People's Liberation Army, composed of coastal urban dwellers, say no. By June 4th, Dung has another idea. He's going to bring army units hand-picked that are composed of country folk from the interior of China who hate the city folk. This is town versus gown stuff going thousands of years back. The people from the interior of China are treated like dirt by the people on the coast. The people in the rural areas of China, traditionally for thousands of years, have been treated like scum peasants by the people in the big cities. Now these peasant soldiers are going to get their revenge on those cute city boys. With the limited number of units loyal to dump, Beijing is surrounded by forces, and on the night of June 3rd, 4th, those forces move in. Now, there's another happy happenstance. Just before this, Mikhail Gorbachev, leader of the Soviet Union, was visiting Beijing. The international press, the international media, had gone to Beijing to cover his uh, visit, because it's big news, leader of Russia, leader of China. And the press became fascinated with the Tiananmen Square movement, with the student demonstrators. There were thousands of international press in Beijing after Gorbachev's trip, continuing to report on what was going on, because, again, the same things were going on in Eastern Europe, and they were producing the fall of communism there. No reporter worth his salt wanted to be uh, away from Beijing when communism fell there. And communism is shaking apart. When your own army says, no, I'm not going to follow your order, that's a big deal. But now it's the kind of army, the parts of the army that Dunn can trust to really knock heads. The night of June 3rd, 4th, 1989, tanks come in from all around Beijing, converging on Tiananmen Square. They're going to seal the area off, and then they're going to go in and slaughter. Well, they seal the area off. Now, what you don't see in that picture of the what so-called tank man is as these tanks were approaching, there are about 30 of them in line-ahead formation in single file. You only see a few there, but in the long shots, there are about 30 tanks moving in. But because the army was not reliable, because Deng Xiaoping had to cherry-pick units, those tanks were not accompanied by infantry. They were not accompanied by foot soldiers. Foot soldiers would have prevented that. But Deng couldn't trust his army, only parts of it. So an entire line of tanks sees this crazy office worker with a cardboard briefcase and a lunch bag, step in front of the lead tank and say, stop, don't do this. These are our future. These are our students. This is the future. Don't, don't do this. I know what you're going to do. Why else would you be here in tanks? Stop. We know about this. Because while the international media in their had been confined to their hotels and moved away from the sides of the hotel that had view of Tiananmen Square, this wasn't Tiananmen Square. This was a few blocks away at a crossroads, at a traffic light that was in view of several press balconies. This is shown live by satellite on international television. I saw it happen. The, rate, the, the lead tank radioed in what to do because you don't take any initiative in the midst of uh, something like this in a communist police state. You just don't. And the word is, oh, there are cameras on this. Try to go around them. So the tanks back up and they try to go around. And again, he gets in the way and says, stop! This goes on for five minutes. The tanks are going back and forth. He gets in front of them, one after another after another. It's chaos. Then the police 
get into the hotels and get the media to hell away from all windows. No one is filming what happens next. The next shot of Tiananmen Square is take of this of this street corner, should I say, is taken a couple of weeks later, and there's a smear on the ground. Clearly, the moment the cameras were off, that the communists were sure that it wasn't going to be filmed, they just ordered the tanks to roll right over him. He died a martyr to freedom, a martyr to something that you and I take for granted every single day. The tanks arrived in Tiananmen, and the people were stampeded just out of Tiananmen Square. Most of them were killed, not in the square, but in the areas away from the square that they thought were safe, that they were trying to retreat to. It was a trap. Those students and their supporters who weren't killed in the massacre, several thousand were, were arrested, tortured, harvested for their organs after they were shot in the back of the head. Their families were mailed the price, a bill for the price of the bullet. The Chinese Communist Party had just made something crystal clear. They want economic reform to bring in Western money. They want a free market. They want capitalism with Chinese characteristics. But just because you have a free market supervised by the Communist Party. It's very fascist. It's cartel capitalism like Hitler practiced, really. Just because you have a free market, don't think for a moment, don't think for a moment that you're going to have political freedom. The deal we offer you, we the Communist Party of China, offer the Chinese people is this. With the free market, you can become wealthy. We'll encourage it. You can live a life with the best cars that money can buy from anywhere in the world. But don't expect freedom. And so it's been since then. Next week, we will talk about the decolonization, and we'll conclude the course. Thank you. Have a nice day.